Lost Hex is made of multiple levels, each as diverse as the next, made of unique shapes and level design. You know, in all my years as a Sonic fan and as a gamer, I've never heard unique level design used as a selling point for a game. I guess all this nitpicking is finally paying off. Sonic Lost World is, without a doubt, the most polarizing Sonic game to be released in ages, perhaps ever, which is really saying something considering every Sonic game is polarizing. Some people love it and some hate it even more than 06. Yes, that is possible. What do I think? I love it! Sometimes. You know, this isn't even going to be so much a typical Sonic review as it is a gaming injustice video. Seems a lot of people just can't make heads or tails of this game, and it's gotten a really bad rep thanks to professional reviewers, so I'm going to take a stand like the unprofessional twit that I... yeah. So, first let's talk about the controls. This is a huge departure from the way Sonic has moved in other recent games. Admittedly, it takes a lot of getting used to, but hey, it's just something different and new. The best word I can use to describe the game's controls overall is... awkward. Not bad, just awkward. Sonic has multiple running speeds now, ranging from a leisurely stroll to a leisurely jog. This works well enough, and I'm just glad Sonic doesn't control like a car anymore. Seriously, you can turn anywhere you want on a dime, even when running at top speed unless you're in an automated mock speed section. With the boost to win controls, something as simple as turning became all but impossible once you reached a certain speed. That's why moves like drifting and quick stepping and whatever were even needed. And yeah, you can say that's more realistic, but it just made it a pain to play a Sonic anywhere but in corridors where all you really can do is careen forward, which that Sonic was clearly built to do. The controls felt better in Generations, but I think a big part of why I was even able to appreciate them was because the level design often slows a player down enough to get a better feel of them. In this game, the controls are really responsive, though maybe a little too much so. It's kind of tricky to explain, but in my experience, there were many instances where Sonic would just go too far this way or that way because I was fighting the way the game played. It's all about the mindset you're in and how you approach things. You just really need to get a feel for these things. And some will get it, but some won't. We'll come back to this later on. Some of you may recall me criticizing the boost in past games because it was essentially a second default running speed for Sonic, which I felt was redundant and pointless. In this game though, the multiple running speeds have a point to make Sonic more controllable, not less. Like a lot of things in this game, I found the way Sonic moves on the ground to be a refreshing change of pace. That said, I wouldn't mind going back to the way the classics and adventure games controlled, where Sonic has a steady, smooth acceleration that just felt a lot more natural. In this game, we only have two extremes, slowing down to a crawl or instantly reaching the top speed, which feels kind of dumb. While I would say there's some kind of momentum, it's just really weird. Your mind may play tricks on you, and you'll end up overshooting or undershooting depending on the situation. You might expect Sonic to be flung into oblivion and hold yourself back only to fall short of some place where you would have wound up just fine if you just go for it. Or you might wait too long and not have enough room on the next precarious platform you could so easily slip off of and do. There are some places where, if you get through without any trouble, you might have just been lucky. Admittedly though, this is probably due to the unique level design, which we'll get into later. Like I said, the controls are awkward, but they do work once you learn to sync yourself with Sonic or whatever. Now let's talk about Sonic's moveset. The parkour mechanic is an ingenious idea that opens up so many new possibilities for unique level design. However, the controls are, again, quite awkward. Most of the time I could get where I wanted, but I never really knew how I did. It's still a really helpful feature that I was able to use to save myself more than once, and it just made the terrain less restricting. I felt so much less confined than usual, and I feel that something like this was necessary for the development of 3D Sonic gameplay sooner or later, and if they continue to develop this innovative new mechanic, I think they'd be able to overcome so many hurdles that have been there since the adventure games. That said, it's far from perfected. While it has gotten me out of a jam from time to time, it's also gotten me killed. And then there were times when it almost got me killed and I still somehow managed to save myself. Good mechanic. Great idea. Needs work. I do wish it was more intuitive, but I don't want something like this to just go away. Many of Sonic's past moves return, including the bounce bracelet, which feels great to use, though it's pretty odd that you can only do it thrice. And then there's a the spin dash! It's about freaking time we got to use that again. It's not quite the ideal spin dash, but it is fun to use. Charging it up and triggering it once will only get you so far, which is how the spin dash works, but if you hold down the button a second time, you can continue rocketing forward for a while, making it something like... well, like the boost. I find it much more fun to use though, because oddly enough, Sonic seems to control best when just rolling along like this, with such fluidity. 
The Super Pilot is kind of back, although it's really nerfed. Doing this, I'm flying into a pit more than once, but I guess it's just me being stupid. Then there's the homing attack, which they've played around with a lot in this game. In fact, you could say that in some ways the gameplay is built around the homing attack. Now, instead of homing in on one enemy, Sonic can lock onto many enemies and tear through them all just like that. Okay, look, I'm gonna be honest. I think this is just stupid. I've always seen the homing attack for what it is. A cop-out. A simple compensation for bad controls. Which is really odd because I think the adventure games had great controls and never needed something like the homing attack to begin with. Nonetheless, this is just a way to make up for cases where it's really, really hard to manually aim at an enemy and land on them on your own. And such a simple thing shouldn't be so hard to do. People sometimes say it's harder to do in a 3D space, but Mario doesn't have a hard time landing on things. Crash doesn't have a hard time landing on things. It's all they do. To this, some would say it's just particularly difficult to do as Sonic because he's just too darn fast and powerful, but again, I wouldn't say that's the case with games like Adventure. I mean, let's think about what you have to do to pull off a successful homing attack. Press a button twice. Okay. Now try pressing the same button over and over again while pressing nothing else. That's all it is, people. Mindless repetitive button mashing. But as if even that was just too much input to demand from the player. Now you only need to do it that first time and watch the game play itself. Really? Is this going to become some new staple of the Sonic series? This is a thing now? That said, I found myself using it a lot in this game. Yeah, while you can manually aim at enemies, and I did more than once, Sonic does kind of need the homing attack in this game. Sonic controls alright while running, while on the ground, but when you're jumping, yeah, you can still lose control really fast, so as bad as it sounds, this is sadly another one of too many cases where the homing attack is mainly useful because the alternative is a pain. And I don't care if people say I'm nitpicking when I say this is a bad thing. It's unacceptable. It's just a stupid mechanic that's getting worse and worse, but hey, with the armies of bad nicks littered everywhere, the chain homing attack does save a lot of time, so I guess that's why it's there. Speaking of saving time, there is one big innovation to the homing attack that I appreciate. If you linger before striking an enemy, more and more ridicules will pop up and pile onto that single enemy, not unlike the chain homing attack highlighting multiple enemies. As you charge up a homing attack, it becomes more powerful and does much more damage. It can make short walk of bosses, and in the case of stronger than average enemies such as slicers, who you normally need to hit three times, you can use a supercharged homing attack to take them all down in a single hit. And it's so satisfying to hear that noise made upon impact when you know you've hit them really hard. <laughs> How handy would an ability like this have been in Sonic Heroes, or Shadow, or Six, or any game in which enemies have health bars? I think this is a really good compromise, and while I don't really like the homing attack at all in general, I do really like this innovation made to it. Gives it a bit of an edge, and makes the game feel a tad less automated for once, you know? Gives the player a better effect on the action. One new move Sonic has is the kick. Basically, instead of doing a normal homing attack, Sonic will fling an enemy at any others who happen to be in the line of fire. You can take on many enemies with a single kick if you're a little creative about it, and I found it a good way to mix things up. Come to think of it though, you could already do this sort of thing with a homing attack in other recent games like Unleashed, but seeing how the homing attack is used in this game, that sort of thing would only work against the player and create a lot of bad situations, mainly in places where the only way of crossing a bottomless pit is using enemies as a bridge. So I'm glad they split this into two different context-appropriate moves that give the player more options, more choices for how they approach a fight. Overall, Sonic is a pretty good moveset. While I find the overpowered chain homing attack to be a bit much, I do appreciate the innovations made to Sonic's moveset in general, especially during a fight with a horde of badniks. Bouncing, kicking, spin dashing, the supercharged homing attack, uh, again, options. And then there's these. Ugh, why is this here? Why are any of these here? Okay, so the wisps are kind of hard to talk about. On one hand, they don't pop up very often. On the other hand, there are occasions where you're forced to use them. On one hand, they're a little more interactive than in the past. On the other hand, you mainly tilt the gamepad to interact with them instead of using buttons. On one hand, they're in this game! On the other hand, they're in this game. The Wisps are utterly superfluous now. In Sonic Colors, they added so much to the gameplay, opening so many new places to explore and making the levels feel so vast. They were an integral part of the game's whole feel, and it wouldn't be nearly as interesting without them. In Lost World, they don't really add anything. They've been reduced to a pesky gimmick that doesn't really need to be there at all. And when they're not an afterthought, they're a nuisance. When I found out that my wish to see the Drill Wisp used in 3D underwater sections from back of my Sonic Colors review had come true, 
I could only smile. Back then, I imagined it being something like playing a Star Fox game. Playing it first hand wasn't nearly as riveting as I'd hoped it would be. In fact, I'm pretty underwhelmed by all the wisps in this game, and even after I've collected them, I don't use them if I can help it. That's not a good sign. I don't hate the wisps in this game, but I'm just so dumbfounded that they're even there. Especially since there's no in-game explanation for their presence whatsoever, so what, is this like another one of their homeworlds or something? Eh, works for me, I guess. On another note, we get these max speed sections, and I love how they're handled here. Aside from one or two levels centered around this gameplay, most of these sections are over quickly and usually out of the way. They're always on cylinders, so falling off the edges isn't a worry since there is none. They're littered with oodles of hazards and rings, so it's like a minigame to see how many rings you can accumulate without getting hit, and they aren't even that hard. Like I said, most of them are out of the way and usually only accessible by a special golden cannon that you find while exploring. So it's a fun little way to challenge yourself rather than some dumb gimmick that's haphazardly forced upon you. So yeah, they're good. Nothing like 06. Or even those pesky quick-stepping sections from other games. The bosses are... well, again, thanks to the supercharged homing attack, they can be over in no time flat. And the bosses aren't by any means hard. That said, I do appreciate how creative they can be. And they're pretty satisfying. The final boss in particular... Well, I do like his design, though I think it's kind of a cop-out that the mech itself doesn't really fight you, only its arms that attach and move around on their own do. So, yeah, it's just a Sonic Colors boss fight with a new skin, and can you really blame them for that? It's like the only final boss we haven't hated in recent games. I would have preferred for this to be like a wrestling match of sorts, with the mech stomping around and trying to crush you and whatnot. Yeah, that would be cool. Still, this is admittedly pretty fun, for what it is. Overall, I'd say the bosses are the weakest element of this game, but they aren't by any means bad. I do like them. I just would have liked to get a little more out of them. I really like how the enemies in general are handled. We get to see all sorts of badniks from all the Genesis games return, but there's also a lot of really cool new original badniks to mix things up. Some of the enemies are kind of underwhelming in terms of how they attack you, but some of them are really creative. The sheer quantity of enemies is something else. There's more of them than ever to deal with, but they don't slow the experience down much. Normally, I'd save all the extra things like the story, the music, and graphics and whatnot for last, but given how I really feel about the level design, I'm gonna change things around and get all this stuff out of the way now. Okay, so, I know a lot of you got mad at me for my If Sonic Lost World Had Better Music video, but listen, I don't think the music is downright bad. I just didn't think that what I'd heard by then was appropriate for a Sonic game. Windy Hill's theme still stinks to me. It's bouncy and repetitive and just doesn't sound adventurous enough for my taste. It feels like I'm on my way to a picnic or something. Which isn't the kind of feeling that giant insane rock formations suspended in the sky typically instill in me. That said, I love the music that plays in Act 2. So relaxing. Actually, I do like most of the music in this game. Some tunes are kind of odd, but they almost always fit the levels they play in. There's a lot of strong, distinct, memorable melodies, and some tunes really are just downright pleasant. So yeah, it's a good soundtrack. I just think some of these tunes are kind of weak, but I do find myself humming most of them from time to time. Another reason I like a lot of them is because, well, they remind me of Mega Man music, and that's changed a lot from series to series. So while I may not think a lot of these tunes are quite Sonic-y enough, that's pretty subjective. I love the graphics and art style. It's so bright and colorful and just burns itself into your eyes. There were hardly any set pieces I could say I didn't like the look of, and it's all so memorable. The colors may be a little oversaturated for some people, but I think the color composition is wonderful. A lot of elements from the classics are given a facelift, but not so much that it feels like the whole game is just nostalgia whoring. While very cartoony and slick, I wouldn't call the style overly simple. And there's a lot of subtle details you have to keep an eye out for, such as the blades of grass swaying in the wind. Everything is just so clean and spick and span, it's like a gigantic playground of a world, and the 60 frames per second the Sonic games have been lacking since the GameCube era is much appreciated. You have to play this on a really swell TV to appreciate just how polished and palpable this world looks. I feel like I could almost touch it! The story is pretty good and has a lot of things going for it, but... Uh... Well, I'm not going to spoil much, but they introduce a lot of random little developments that often feel forced and misplaced. Some scenes are really fun, but a lot of plot developments just don't go anywhere or are ever even explained. What is the Lost Hex? What is this life energy stuff extracted from the Earth? Who are the Deadly Six? What are they? What are the Wisps doing here? In terms of that and potential character development, by the end of it, everything they introduce, everything they had going just stops. And that's it, it just kind of fizzles out and they leave it at that. Alright then, that was something. That said, I do like the dialogue quite a bit. 
There were a lot of lines that made me chuckle and even sometimes made my eyes widen. All in all, I do like the story, but it's not that great. It's just fun while it lasts. In terms of characters, everyone fills their roles as you'd expect, well, almost everyone. But what about the Deadly Six? Well, allow me to sum up their characters like this. I'm evil. I'm girly. I'm old. I'm crazy! I'm a fun -off. Yeah, that's all they amount to. These are not characters. These are caricatures. Some of the most shallow I've ever seen. Each one having a single trait that is essentially their entire identity. I'm not asking for Shakespeare or whatever. They are at least entertaining. I just think most of them are kind of dumb. Zor is my favorite of the whole bunch by far. Mainly because I don't like the other ones much at all. He is yet another stereotype, but that can be funny if you go about it in the right way. And while the other bad guys are just kind of half-hearted and half-assed, the writers went all out with this guy, and almost every line he said stood out to me. As for Knuckles and Amy... Eh, I got nothing. Sometimes I could swear Pontek and What's-His-Face just don't know squat about. Oh, how about that? The voice acting is kinda hit and miss. Some characters sound great and some are just grating. On one hand, we have Mike Pollock turning in what just may be his best performance yet, partly because he just has so many great lines to work with. And on the other hand... That really is how Sonic sounds to me. Alright, I can land this, but it's gonna be bumpy. Sorry about that, Tails. I swallowed a whole pack of gum and now I'm constipated. Seriously, Roger, you were great fun at first, but each subsequent performance just feels more forced, more painful. Heaven enema or something. And finally, now that all those things are out of the way, about that unique level design. This is that part where you're gonna find out just how conflicted I really am about this game. Okay, so th this is one of those idea games, you know? They just kind of dumped a bunch of stuff in there and blended it together. The more straightforward levels at the beginning and end of each zone are usually what you'd expect, but in the middle there's a lot of really gimmicky stages. Some of them I like, and I get that they wanted to break up the pace and give the player more to do, but some of these are just unnecessary, and it really falls apart near the end. There are so many things that are downright gimmicky. I guess they just added things like this solely to extend playtime, like the Werehog. When you people complain that a game like Sonic Generations is too short, this is what happens. Ever heard of replay value? I actually do find myself coming back to a lot of these stages, but some are just totally dumb ideas from the get-go. At times it feels like you're expected to somehow predict or guess what a level is going to do three steps ahead of yourself. You see, there are two ways a game can be hard. Games that are a good kind of hard are challenging and you'll probably die a lot, but you have everything you really need in order to do what the game demands of you. And the game is so refined that you can't blame it for anything that happens to you. I know I've referred to these before, but Jack 3 and Super Mario World really are just great examples of this. In cases like these, if you screw up, it's your fault. Not the games. It's just too perfect. And in the case of games like, well, these, if you're skilled and imaginative enough, you can accomplish even more than what's expected of you. But this game isn't quite like any of those. You're equipped with so much, so many useful moves, yet at times like this, you can't even make the most basic use of them. I could say this is as bad as it gets, but, well, that's only half true. The collectible red wings we've seen a lot of in recent games had a whole new layer of shit to this one. I got so many game overs just trying to grab these things. I really shouldn't have because I almost ruined the whole experience for myself by doing that. In stages like Skyward Act 2, which I actually really enjoyed, they're not that hard to get because they're all on the way, and all you gotta do to nab them is think on your feet in the moment to be quick about it. Alright, that's pretty fair. It kinda goes back to what I was saying before about those other games. But in some of the more open levels, the stunts they expect you to somehow pull off, the angles at which you have to wild run and whatnot is just unreasonable. There are even a few stages in which it's pretty much impossible to get all five in the same run. I still haven't gotten them all, and I honestly don't care to. I've pretty much given up on that. Look. Do yourself a favor when playing through this game for the first time. Ignore the red rings. Well, most of them. Just pretend they aren't there. Play this game the way you'd play any other Sonic game. Just breeze through and take it as you go along. This will save you so much stress and frustration and teeth gnashing because the placement of these things is just evil. Most of them, anyway. Hey guys, Nick here. As you've probably guessed, my time with this game has been pretty surprising, and my general opinion has changed more than once. Sorry to derail the review like this, but to really understand the kind of impact this game has had on me, we'll need to go back a ways. Looking back at when those first reviews were being released a month ago, I brushed them off as not being anything noteworthy. 
The complaints that the game was too slow, too finicky, or just too darn hard seemed like a crock of shit to me, and I simply couldn't imagine this game being as hard or even just as crazy as even the people on Sega Forums and Sonic Retro were making it out to be. They're exaggerating, I thought. I was so confident in myself that one of the first things I planned to do with this review was to throw a skit in there in which I'd mockingly pretend to be a PROFESSIONAL reviewer having a hissy fit because I just couldn't figure out how the game worked. Then I played the game, and my opinion changed. I couldn't wrap my brain around how the game worked and had a really hard time with it as it went on. I chalked it all up to increasingly unfair level design and just really bad ideas. After many a strained I had a completely different script in the works for this review, pretty much bashing the game. By the time I beat the game, I was exhausted and couldn't be bothered to play it anymore. While there were still things I loved about it, there were times when I felt like I just hated the whole damn thing. Then I saw this. These people need to get better at video games. Clement's words struck me in a powerful way. I decided to give the game another chance. I hadn't even played it for a few days, so you'd think I'd be too rusty to do anything right. But I went back to some of the stages that gave me a lot of trouble before, and I beat most of them in a few tries, sometimes just one. It's weird, but suddenly the game just didn't seem that hard anymore. Clement's simple statement made me focus, and everything just seemed so much more possible. And while there were still a few bullshit stages, they didn't give me nearly as much trouble as before. Just like that, so many of the things that I was going to criticize this game for weren't that big of a deal. I realized I'd gone about this whole game the wrong way. It wasn't ever really as needlessly brutal as I thought it was. It just seemed like that because I'd been fighting the game, going against its flow, simply refusing to play by its rules because I was in a totally wrong mindset right from the beginning. Now, all the frustration was melting away. I could do things that I thought I couldn't before. I even started collecting red rings again, and as of now, I have them all. So, yeah, I take back some of what I said before derailing this whole thing. There's a reason this review took so long to finish, guys. Seeing Clement's review along with Johnny, Steve's, and so on made me reevaluate a lot of my thoughts on this game, and I've been playing it some more to get a better feel of it. And it was worth it. Thank you, Clement. You've saved this game for me. Sorry we're jumping around a lot, but just bear with me, guys. This will all make sense soon enough. Anyway, back to the red rings. Like I said, some of them aren't that hard to get, so if you do conveniently spot them on the way, get them. Why? The flickies. You see, to reach the end of each zone, you'll need to have collected a certain amount of them throughout the game by that time. If you haven't collected enough Sun and Moon Talk, I mean, flickies by then, you're stuck. You can only find so many in the stages themselves, but this was never a problem for me, because I did get my hands on a decent amount of red rings, which unlock a special circus tent each time you collect five of them. Within a zone, anyway. In these tents are mini-games that I actually had a lot of fun with. It's here that you can easily get lots and lots of flickies in no time. So much so that these tolls became insignificant and shouldn't be a problem at all if you play your cards right, and never were for me. So collecting red rings makes it easier to collect flickies, and while it doesn't hold a candle to Sonic Color's Game Land, it's still a good idea. A fair enough exchange. And heck, I'll take the minigames over these. Getting all the red rings earns you Super Sonic, who's so amazing that he has two mouths. Now he can talk and eat at the same time without being rude. That aside, this Super Sonic is pretty ideal. He attracts rings, he's immune to various hazards, and he, well, he buzzes around like a Super Saiyan, which, come on, let's stop kidding ourselves. That's what they try to make him in Generations, and they totally frack that up. This Super Sonic feels a little more restrained, a little more like in the classics. He's not perfect, though. Oddly enough, Sonic reverts back to normal in the mock speed sections, which just makes me want to avoid them, and you can still fall into bottomless pits. Uh, Alright then. I think Super Sonic has a lot of missed potential. Parkour is no less dangerous than ever, and I would have loved to see him effortlessly cling to walls and just go wherever. I mean, come on, this is supposed to be game-breaking to some degree. Overall, Super Sonic is pretty darn fun to use, though it won't get you out of every bad situation. In fact, there are some places where being Super Sonic is a detriment, like in Frozen Factory Act 4, where you just fall through bridges of ice into bottomless pits. I consider it barely worth the effort of collecting the red rings. Now back to the level design overall. While the 2D areas are kind of weak, I appreciate that there are more slopes now, making them feel something like the classics, whereas the 2D areas in Sonic Colors were the complete opposite, still very complex and cool, but cluttered with blocks. While some gimmicks are reused from time to time, there's still a lot of fresh elements in each zone, simple things that help them stand out. However, there's a lot more to be said about the 3D areas, which I feel are much more interesting. These stages are action-packed and filled to the brim with things to interact with, including the environment itself. 
Things that would have been an obstacle in any other game become part of a labyrinthine obstacle course, with every which way leading to something. I love that there's so much platforming, yet most of it is, indeed, environmental, with the typical mysterious floating blocks platformers are known for being chock full of being a surprising rarity in this game. I love how expansive some areas are, and how many elements from the classic games have been SUPERCHARGED! There are some levels where things slow down, but it's not a slow slog of a game. Some levels are bogged down by a dumb gimmick, but I really don't mind them that much. It's only a few of them that are ever truly a pain. One of my favorite stages in the entire game is Tropical Coast Act 1. This is the perfect stage. Well, almost. It's spacious, it's got lots of great platforming that's really just more terrain to climb around on, and there's a lot of fun alternate routes to explore that coalesce together, rather than feeling like strings laid on a floor that only occasionally overlap. It's got just about everything I've been asking for in pretty much all of my past Sonic reviews, and as far as Lost World goes, it's basically my ideal Sonic stage. The level design is just that great. But it's not just because of that. I'm going to bring up a point that some people would use against this game, but I'd call it a positive. See, as much as stages like this have going on in them, you can mostly ignore all that if you want. Why is this a good thing? Well, it's not really, but it's a good compromise. See, those of you who actually want a shallow experience in which you just kinda plow through to the end, you can do that. Not all the time, but a pretty big chunk of it. But for guys like me, that just isn't enough. So for guys like me who like to explore and interact with the game and whatnot, we can just go a little to the right or left and see how things go from there. We can do that. We can all do whatever we want. It's this kind of deep, seamlessly layered level design reminiscent of the classic games with our high roads and low roads and whatnot that I think really makes Lost World shine at times. It gives the player options. That's the word I've been using a lot, huh? It just makes it so that more than one kind of player can enjoy this game, because it was made for more than one kind of player. So those who want none of it can just ignore a lot of what they see, but for guys like me, it's there. And there's a lot of content to be enjoyed this way. I think this is a wonderful approach to things that works really well. That said, make no mistake, this game is no cakewalk. If anything, it's one of the most punishing Sonic games I've ever played. You slip up in any way, and this game just says fuck you and die. When it's not just being random and gimmicky, some of the level design really can be downright retarded. And for every spurt of utter brilliance, there's also the occasional brain fart. But what makes it hurt most is that you no longer farm extra lives by collecting rings. Are you kidding me? Do you have any idea how many fewer game overs I would have seen if only I could do that? Why did they remove this simple, basic feature that has been a staple of the Sonic series since the beginning? What, would it suddenly make the game too easy? And have too many lives too easily? You know what, even in Unleashed, you at least got an extra life for the first hundred rings you collected. Honestly, the whole concept of lives and game overs just seems pointless in this day and age where games aren't made to drain our pockets of all our quarters by killing us. This change just baffles me, because out of all the elements they brought back from the good old days, all the nifty things they threw in there, SOMEONE thought it would be a great idea to leave that out. What the hell? Funnily enough though, this game should easily scratch the edge of all you people out there who complain about platformers being too casual these days. Being one of those fabled platformer masochists myself, I can only say MAN UP, YOU ASKED FOR IT. That said, I wish they'd balance things out by making life farming efficient. For everything this game gets right, it also gets something not so right. In the end, this is just one of those rough around the edges sorts of games. You know there's another game that comes to mind when I think about this one? It's called Sonic the Hedgehog. The original. I think this game is great, and so do a lot of gamers. But there's a big chunk who say this is the worst Genesis Sonic game. And you know what? I can see where they're coming from. Think of it this way. If a game's sequels improve the formula more or less established by earlier entries, then naturally that makes those earlier entries inferior to the later ones. Sonic 2 is better than Sonic 1. So that inevitably makes Sonic 1 inferior to Sonic 2. That doesn't make Sonic 1 a bad game, it just had room for improvement, which came with later games. The formula of the Genesis era gameplay was expanded upon in Sonic 2 and refined to perfection in Sonic 3K. Then came the jump to 3D, and the Sonic cycle began. While I personally find Sonic's gameplay more enjoyable in Sonic Adventure 1 than 2, I admit that the former is very rough around the edges, and Sonic Adventure 2 was a more refined, focused take on SA1 in a lot of ways, so it's aged better. Though I still think the design philosophies and whatnot of SA1 still stand strong, and I enjoy it for that. They could have kept improving upon this formula, but they kinda lost focus, and then... this happened. This was a huge wake-up call for Sonic Team. 
You see, when a movie flops, it never really crosses the minds of the producers that maybe the movie failed because the acting was bad, or the writing was bad, or even that the movie itself was bad. That isn't what matters to them. Look at something like The Shawshank Redemption. That movie's regarded as one of the greatest ever made, but did it sell well? There you go. They focus on trivial things, like what would make something more marketable to select focus groups. This movie failed because it didn't have enough star power. If we featured actor A, then the product would have appealed more to demographic B. I think the gaming industry has adopted a similar way of thinking. Like it or not, Sonic 06 is the closest we'll ever come to having a Sonic Adventure 3, because it mimics Adventure 1 so fervently, rather than simply try to redeem themselves by trying again and seeing if they could still make this formula work. Sega and Sonic Team abandoned Sonic Adventure's gameplay style and tarnished image altogether, out of an understandable fear that anything even remotely resembling Sonic Adventure and by association Sonic 06 could only turn people away from that point on. So, they whipped up a radical new gameplay style that was nothing like it. Sonic Unleashed is a mixed bag no matter how you look at it. The daytime stage gameplay is so fleeting that all sorts of padding is thrown in there to extend playtime. Some people loved it, some people hated it, and I hate the things other people loved about it. But hey, it was Sonic Team's first try with this playstyle. And with colors and generations, they played around with this new formula of theirs and more or less perfected it with the modern stages. And now, here we are again. Instead of expanding upon the daytime stage formula some more, they've whipped up yet another new gameplay style that, while very playable, still clearly has a lot of kinks to work out of it. And I don't mind that one bit. Like it or not, the aftermath of Sonic 06 taught Sonic Team not to stick to any one particular formula for too long, lest they grow complacent and repeat their mistakes and almost kill the franchise. Again. For better or worse, they've created this crazy cycle where they'll develop a gameplay style over 3-5 to five years, make a few games, and then they go right back to the drawing board to reinvent things all over again. And like it or not, no matter what they do, no matter what innovative new gameplay style they come up with, they just never seem capable of getting it right on the first try. To me, this is nothing new. A lot of people are basically asking Sonic Team to go back to the daytime stage formula and feel that Lost World's gameplay is going to kill the franchise. And let me just tell you this now. You have no idea what you're talking about. Just like I had no idea what I was talking about back in my early days on YouTube. When I first started reviewing Sonic games in 2009, it was pretty much for the sole purpose of shooting down Sonic Unleashed and sharing what I thought made other Sonic games great. I loved Unleashed at first, but grew sick of the daytime stages. And I was really worried that this bizarre new gameplay was just how all Sonic games were going to be from that point on. As this game, and even those that came before it have shown, I was dead wrong all along. What some of you guys are feeling right now is the exact same misplaced fear I had when the daytime stage formula was introduced. And it's the same feeling a lot of people had when Sonic jumped from 2D to 3D. And you can bet that by the time the formula changes yet again, and we enter yet another crazy new phase of Sonic's development, this will have grown on people enough for them to be afraid of taking that next step. Again. No, this is not how all Sonic games will play from now on. They'll make a sequel or two and move on to something else. Sonic Team might pick and choose and mix and match certain elements from past games, but nothing stays the same for long anymore. The Sonic formula is constantly changing, with that being the only one true constant. And if you don't like Lost World because it's too different, so what? I don't like Unleashed, but I wrote out that phase of the Sonic franchise and I was rewarded for it, and here we are. At this point guys, I'm just going along for the ride. You'd best do the same. Here's the simplest way I can put it. There's a chunk of this game that I just love and can't get enough of. There's a chunk that I hate, though it's much smaller than it used to be, and then there's a chunk that just baffles me to no end. When all is said and done, Sonic Lost World is just a very weird game. Some people, like Clement, will pick it up and love it right from the get-go because, well, they get it, while others, including myself, struggle just to understand it. Obviously, this game is not for everybody, but can you really say that about any game? I know the simple fact that I ever got tired of this game at all is pretty much a death sentence on its own, but you must understand, I was simply in the wrong frame of mind at the time, and that's the sort of thing that can kill this game. But that's just me. This game is an acquired taste, and how much you enjoy it is entirely dependent on whether or not you can get used to the game, how receptive you are to it, and just what you're looking for in a Sonic game. You probably won't have to go through the process that I did, and you don't have to be some super elite gaming guru god or whatever to enjoy it in the first place. It just varies from person to person. Once I finally found myself in the right mindset, I really started to love this game, and all my problems with it just melted away. I'm not damage controlling or whatever, this is just my experience with it. And honestly, I can't recommend this game. But it's not what you think. What I mean is, I can't tell you if this game is for you or not. That is up to you. I was drawn to this game because it has a lot of what I want in a Sonic game. 
platforming, exploration, surreal cartooning environments, significant replay value, those are what drew me to it. But that's a personal thing. Yet I was so drawn to the game that I wasn't going to let what some guy on IGN or GameSpot or whatever said stop me from trying it myself. The only gaming injustice I see here is the undeserved bad reception this game got because of a few schmucks with a paycheck who probably just didn't know what they were getting themselves into. And a lot of people are so spoiled by the boost to win gameplay they've gotten used to that a slightly slower Sonic game with wild new controls and more complex level design is just too much for them to handle. I honestly don't give a crap about what these PROFESSIONAL reviewers have to say, and I honestly don't understand why anyone ever would. Like these guys are special and know what's best or whatever. They're just dumb gamers like you and me guys. Putting guys like that on a pedestal and thinking, oh well this game is bad because this guy said it's bad, is completely alien to me because when you think like that, you're really just letting someone else do your thinking for you. You're letting them make your decisions. That's stupid. To anyone who cancelled their pre-order or whatever after seeing one of these reviews, fuck that noise, you're a flake. Think for yourself. And before you call me a hypocrite for saying that, no, I'm not telling you to just go by what I say and let me do your thinking for you either. That's why I can't outright recommend this game. I enjoyed it. It was kind of a rough ride, but in the end I consider it worth every penny. But again, this is just me, and your experience with it could be completely different, so I can't decide if any one of you should play it. Heck, your experience might even be much better than mine was, but how would I know? You could just as easily love it or hate it, it all depends on you. So if you're even a little bit interested in this game and have the time for it, do what I did. Watch gameplay footage of it, good gameplay footage. See what your friends think of it, look at it from both sides and see if Lost World scratches your itch, because you might really, really like it, but only if it works for you. So, final thoughts. If my personal opinion of it matters much, and I'm guessing it does if you've sat through this whole thing, is Lost World good or not? In my opinion, yes, it's incredibly flawed, but money well spent for the sheer amount of content to be explored and enjoyed and to challenge yourself with. I think it's a solid game, and it's only as hard as you make it out to be. And I really must thank Clement for making me see the lie and essentially saving the game for me, because there is a lot of fun to be had in it. I was never really that bothered by this level, or this level, or this level, and anything that did bother me at first was only a problem because of how I approached the game. And I really need to emphasize just how important that is. This game is very rewarding if you approach it with a right mindset. I like the innovations made to how Sonic moves and plays, though I do wish the game wasn't so darn gimmicky at times. I love the level design, and overall just found this game refreshing. It's hard to say whether it's a good or bad game in the general sense, but I had fun. It's just a very particular sort of game that some people will enjoy much more than others depending on what they want it to be, and not everyone is going to get it. But don't be afraid to give it a try yourself. It just might be the most interesting Sonic game you've played in, like, ever. Come to think of it, the way I feel about Lost World is not like my fondness for Super Mario Sunshine. Yeah, Lost World is reminiscent of the Mario Galaxy games, but I honestly think it's the sunshine of this series. It's not perfect, and there are awkward, frustrating parts of it, but the good parts are something to be remembered, and it's just something interesting and different and new, and that alone should be appreciated. That's it, if you're one of those types who simply can't handle anything a little out of their comfort zone and didn't appreciate sunshine back in the day, well, you'll probably feel the same way about Lost World, but, uh, hey, that's it, this is one of those special games. Yeah, I'm sorry if I haven't done a good job selling this game to you and convincing you about its quality, but that's not really why I'm here. I don't rate games with a number or whatever. I mean, some people seem to think that anything lower than an 8 is bad, so what's the point? While I will defend this game, people like my reviews because I throw everything on the table. Everything I like and don't like is addressed and compared to see if the good parts of a game outweigh the bad and make it worth playing solely for that. So judge for yourself based on what you've seen and heard whether or not this is a game made for you. And that's all I really have left to say. Well, I hope that was something because I made myself sick just editing this review. Uh, if you excuse me, I need a break from this. Oh, wow. Yeah, you he see that? He's he got two mouths. Mouth. <laughs> what the hell? Oh, Sonic team. <laughs> yep, they ran out of money. <laughs> uh, this is the newest Sonic game that apparently has been, you know, pulling people left and right. You know, some people love this game. Some people hate this game. Some people 
think, oh no, the Dark Age of Sonic is back. <laughs> no, it's not. Holy hell, guys, was there any implication that I wasn't going to review the latest Sonic game in the franchise? The day I stopped reviewing Sonic games is the day I either review the very last one I haven't looked at, or if I become a billionaire. How do you know that he was black? Well, because he always had rap music in all his levels. Only at your racism, hot Man, I hope that this is not infected, man. You're going to be fine, donkey! You ruined my mind. Please get Blazer Roots back in here. Actually, no, I'm thinking Grapple turned them to bring that rainbow too. 